Welcome to Board Games Anonymous, the podcast with board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. Hey, this is Anthony. And this is episode 256, Top 10 Sub-Hobbies of Gaming. All right, Anthony, so it looks like we have a somewhat to the left or to the right of gaming episode here. Yeah, yeah, these are always fun. Like, every now and then, it's just stuff related to this hobby instead of, like, specifically stuff from the hobby, right? And I feel like after the last four weeks of just listing games and talking about upcoming games and listing games that were upcoming last year, and you get a little bit of hangover. I mean, I... I didn't count it up, but I think we've talked about close to 100 different games in the last three weeks, and <laughs> that's it's a lot, guys. So uh, this week we'll talk about some hobbies that are not necessarily gaming related. You know, I, people ask us all the time to like, do, do you paint things? Do you, you know, build your own inserts? Do all sorts of stuff. There's a lot of different things you can do that aren't necessarily just playing games. Yeah, there's a lot of hobbies, and you don't realize that you're actually participating in these board gaming hobbies until someone actually points that out. And you're like, oh, I was doing another thing the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> and it's actually funny to hear all the little side stories that gamers have as far as pursuing the hobby and what goes into it and all the stores and all the other things that you do in order to make gaming the best. Because, honestly, it's the best hobby out there. So we're going to talk more about that in our feature review. Uh, but before we get into that, we'd like to send a big shout out to our new Patreon backer, Ryan Herbold. Thank you for backing us and thank you for helping us bring you a brand new episode. All right, Anthony, so let's jump into it. And what's our question of the week? All right. Yeah, so I've been doing these the last few weeks where we have our big feature and then I ask everybody immediately afterwards what they think. Um, kind of like a call and response. So this week's question of the week is, what is your most anticipated board game release of 2020? Uh, last week, we gave you 35 different games and expansions from our list, and I knew it wasn't complete because going through the list of 2020 games that have already been announced, there's tons of stuff we didn't cover. So I figured, why not give the listeners a chance to, to shout out some games? Um, our buddy Dave, of course, kicks it off by saying, <laughs> I don't look forward to anything. I'm going to play my unplayed games, which, sure, Dave, <laughs> that's what we all think, right? <laughs> You damn kids and your rock and roll music. <laughs> Stay off my lawn. <laughs> if you pull that off, though, I'll be very impressed because that's always my goal, too, and it just doesn't happen. All right, so some stuff that people are actually looking forward to. John mentions Legends of Sleepy Hollow, which he's pretty sure is coming out in 2020, maybe 2021. I think he's probably right about 2020. This was a, We saw a preview of this at Gen Con in 2018, So, and then they put the kickstarter up not too long after that so it's got to be coming pretty soon i would imagine and that, that was a cool one because it had like all these different huge map pieces like it was very expensive because it tons of boards in the box we have let's see here scott mentioned spirit island uh mm -hmm. also he says something about a jurassic world miniatures game Ooh. so i don't i don't actually know anything about that uh but he mentions a, a bgg thread about it i don't most Jurassic Park World stuff tie-ins are bad, and yet they're also somehow good because <laughs> it's dinosaurs. So I'm, I'm in. I'll check that out. I did hear that there's going to be a Jurassic Park tie-in to the Funko universe, their Funko strategy game, which oh, yeah. is odd and horrifying at the same time. Although I guess if you get to play the dinosaurs as an actual character in the game, that might actually be pretty cool. Have you played that game? I've heard it's actually apparently pretty good. I haven't played it. I own way too many Funkos to, in good conscience, buy it. But at the same point, if I can battle Golden Girls versus uh, Raptor, yeah, I actually <laughs> might actually pick this one up. Yeah, I have, the, I have like the Batman set around here somewhere because I got it to play with the kids and then I just never got around to learning it. And I'm like, I should do that because it's apparently not a bad game. Yeah. All right, so other stuff people mentioned. Chris mentions Alter Quest uh, and Dwellings of Eldervale. Those are both Kickstarters from the last year or so uh, that we've seen floating around cons for the last few months slash years. Jonathan mentions Ex Expedition to Newdale, which is actually one I forgot because that is one I'm looking forward to. It's a Alexander Pfister game. It's Oh My Goods the Board Game, basically. Mm -hmm. It came out at yeah. Madison. We have Steven, who is optimistic that we'll see Pandemic Legacy Season 3 this year. So... That will be huge if it actually comes out this year. I don't know what the timeline is for that. Um, 
Mike mentions clinic as well as smartphone, which we did talk about. My, another, another Mike <laughs> mentions Endeavor's expansion, the age of expansion. Uh, and we have Tidal Blades is another big one. And this another mm. Kickstarter that's shipping pretty soon. So pretty much all like the big box, thematic stuff, miniatures, things that we kind of skipped over. We did have like six people mention the Spirit Island expansion too. So I think it's safe to say that one's pretty uh, highly anticipated. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of great games. I think we talked about it last time how there's going to be more games that we don't even know about that's going to be popping up, and especially the Kickstarters. I mean, it seems more and more these days we're definitely moving towards a Kickstarter industry, and that's something that, you know, there's been a lot of consternation about that over the years, about will Kickstarter blow up? Where's the Kickstarter bubble? Where's that Kickstarter game that just bankrupts everybody and no one goes back to it? But it's stayed pretty consistent throughout the way and it's really changed the industry a lot especially you know they kind of blow up and they have their moment in the sun everyone talks about it everyone follows it and then it just disappears and then depending on how good of a kickstarter they're having there's some communication but it's usually what a year year and a half two years sometimes for most Mm -hmm. games i mean that's not even dealing with the delays but You know, you don't hear anything about it. And then randomly something shows up or randomly people start posting that, hey, look, a box came to my door. And you're like, oh, yeah, a (laughs) box. I think I remember that two years ago that ordering that. So, yeah, a lot of changes on what's upcoming for the year. So not too surprising. No, not at all. Yeah, we we were joking last week about my uh, Isle of Cats, my polyomino cat game. And that showed up literally the day after we recorded. (laughs) <laughs> Yay, Polly, I'm no cats. Oh uh, I haven't played God. it yet, but I look forward to reviewing it and having you groan in the background. <laughs> Way ahead of you, buddy. Way ahead of you. <laughs> Polly, I'm no cats. I never thought there would be such a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's what's going on with our listeners. We would love for you to join the conversation. Please join us on social media. I don't have to run through all of them, but we want you to join us on all of them and don't forget we're on youtube so if you are watching videos on there please jump over and subscribe we really appreciate your support it gets the board gaming out to more people and let's bga know that we're on every platform there so youtube twitter all those fun things and especially boardgamersanonymous.com anthony keeps up a fantastic website with written reviews so there is video section there and there is written section. So a little different if uh, the audio podcast isn't enough for your weekly commute. All right, Anthony. So that's what's going on with our listeners. Let's get on to the games that we want to get to the table. Let's talk about our acquisition disorders. All right. Yeah, this was an easy one for me this week. So I got an email on, I don't know, Friday, Thursday or Friday from AEG mm-hmm. announcing Mariposas, which is uh, Elizabeth Hargrave's new game. So that is the designer of Wingspan, for those of you who have not heard of her, but it was the single biggest game of 2019 by a long shot, just in terms of coverage and sales and every other metric. It's probably going to win all the awards. So this is her first official follow-up, because she did like a little wallet game that came out from like Button Shy Games, which is fun. It's a cute little game. She did an expansion for Wingspan, but this is like the first full box big release um, that's been announced from her and it is similarly themed because this is about the migration of butterflies from Mexico up throughout North America, uh, specifically monarch butterflies, and then how they kind of have to multiply and then fly back. So it takes place over three seasons and the goal of the game is to be as efficient as possible in each of those three seasons. So a little bit familiar in terms of like how wingspan works where you have those five separate scoring phases and you have to try to be as efficient as possible between you know, each scoring um, element of the game, not necessarily just try to maximize your engine for the final one, but try to be efficient through all of them. The game doesn't seem to really match up with Wingspan in a lot of other ways, uh, other than how she broke it up, because if you look at the board, it looks almost like an 18xx map, more than (laughs) it does a, uh, (laughs) it's an actual board, right? Versus Wingspan, where you had, you know, just the card play in front of you, which was on a board, but really it was just to facilitate the cards. So we don't really know a whole lot about this other than, you know, kind of the basics of, um, you know, how it's going to play and the theme. But based Mm -hmm. on how she themed Wingspan and based on how carefully she researched and 
built out that game to make sure that you know each of the birds matched up um i'm decently excited for this i think it'll be fun yeah i'm looking forward to this too and aeg is a great company kind of surprised this didn't go to uh stonemaier games but AG, AG has a really good output, and their games are reasonably priced, which is always a very good thing and a, mm-hmm. a welcome change. And as you mentioned, this is a really interesting theme. It's it's fascinating how these, you know, paper thin creatures are able to travel such great distances over all the hardships and be able to do this again and again. So, a fascinating game, as you mentioned. It does look like an eighteen double X game. And, you know, your butterflies are flying through and and, uh, hitting the flowers along the way. So I'm sure it's going to be another big hit. So, yeah, really looking forward to it as well. Yeah, so they 100% agree. I mean, it just looks like it's going to be a a hit for them. Um, And they did announce, too, it's going to be coming out as part of their big game night thing that they do every year. So if you've never been to, like, Gen Con or the cons around there, they have, like, a big game night. It's ticketed. You go in, you you get all their new releases. Uh, but I think this year, too, they're going to do that through local stores as well. So hopefully it means that this is not just out of print and impossible to find for six months after that, because that's usually what happens with the big games. But look for it over the summer. Yeah, don't sleep on this one. It's going to be big, just like uh, Wingspan on some level. We'll find out. All right, so a game that I'm looking forward to is called Paris. This is a game by Michael Kiesling, Wolfgang Kramer, uh, two of our favorite designers, and it'll be published by game brewer so this game will be coming out from what they're saying they're looking at a march 16th uh kickstarter date because again everything's kickstarter these days so basically what you're looking at here is you're looking at paris in the 19th century and the idea is to discover the renowned architecture and obtain the most eminent buildings in the right districts to achieve victory so it's going to be your classic euro game and it's a medium weight game uh, and it's pretty straightforward. There's short player terms, and it's going to be a point salad mechanism. It seems a little bit like, at least from what I can kind of pull together from the actual pictures, there's not a lot of information out there yet, but it's got this round board, and it has a whole bunch of cards placed around the board. And basically the idea seems to be that you are picking up the right buildings, which are going to be a sex collection thing, and then picking up individual kind of final bonus situation so it actually might be like points out of the game the production is beautiful <laughs> uh it really has that really nice kind of like soft blue and gray look to it as i mentioned round board cards out there you are hiding some of your resources behind these you know three-dimensional little building screens so again i mean you can't mess with the designers here this was a prototype at Essen last year, so really looking forward to this. Uh, Game Brewer tends to be a little bit on the high side as far as their Kickstarters are concerned, but with this pedigree, it might actually be something worth picking up. Yeah, it, it certainly looks cool. I love round boards. I don't know what it is about them, but just the, the way they're laid out. Like Merlin, for whatever reason, it's not even nearly close to my favorite Feld game, but I just love that round, circular, not even a rondelle necessarily, just like you're moving around and around and around. <laughs> um, this one's funny though, because I find it strange that no other game has been named Paris, right? Yeah. In 2020, no one's used that because the BGG database, nothing came up. The other thing I find funny is that if you go to the BGG listing, <laughs> it has like 12 mechanics listed. There's no way these are all in this game. It's got action queue, deck building, hand management, point to point movement, set collection, tile placement, trading and worker placement. <laughs> so for a three weight game, that seems like a like a stretch. But yeah, and I think the the main thing is going to be it's going to be a set collection situation mm-hmm. because you see the cards yeah. out there, and since they're referring to it as a point salad, I guess you could pick or have an opportunity to pick what you're going to be scoring, which happens in a lot of games. But I think that's going to be the main mechanic there. Everything else is probably going to be a very secondary function here, as you probably circle the board. Which we, you know, that's the point of a round board, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> All right, so that's everything that we want to hit the table. Let's talk about the games that did hit the tables. I'm going to let you know if those games are by, and you should run out and pick those games up. If those games are a play, and you should sit down and enjoy them. Or if those games are a dodge, and you should avoid them at all costs. Or if they are, in fact, the dreaded burn, and then... 
considering global warming, don't burn it at this point. Just, you know, you know, recycle it, I, I think is probably the best thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pulp it. Just <laughs> Water it down. <laughs> All right, Anthony. So, what do you have for us this week? All right. So, I have. I, I didn't even know we were going to do this. So, it's the first of two splatters. It's, it's so splatter season. Um, it's a rarity. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> um, this is actually not a new game at all. This is the 20th anniversary edition of Roads and Boats, which was their second game and came out way back in 20 or two, 1999, I believe. So this was um, a game that I purchased mm -hmm. at the same time as the game you're going to talk about, the expansion for um, the Food Chain Magnet, and it came in much earlier. So I had this over the summer, but just recently got a chance to play it. It turns out, however, that this game is... Very easy to learn, uh, not easy to play necessarily, but the rules are fairly straightforward mm -hmm. and you kind of just do the thing, right? It's a funny thing, like one of the three of us who showed up didn't have a chance to look over the rules and we're just like, all right, well, here's the basics. Let's just do it and you'll figure it out as you go because there's not really a way to explain how it's going to work. It's all just kind of laid out on your player board. There's a few things you should know and it's just how much are they going to retain over a five hour game. So the basic idea of the game is you start out with just a handful of things. You have a couple donkeys, some wood, and a couple geese. And you need to basically turn all that into a burgeoning empire of different resources that sprawls across the map. The thing about this game is that you don't own anything. The only thing you personally own is your transportation items. So you have donkeys... Later, you'll have wagons, you can get trucks eventually, rafts, boats, all that stuff. Those are yours, and they're in your player color. But all the stuff you build, the various, like if you build a mine or if you build you know, a, a sawmill or something like that, anybody can use them, including the roads. So you start the game in your own little corner of the map, and you get maybe a couple hours to yourself to build up whatever you're building up, and you're going to benefit from your own stuff mostly. But if someone really wants to come in and mess with you and swoop in and use your resource, some of these buildings can only be used once a turn, so they could come in and be like, I go before you, I'm using your thing, which happened. Um, or they could come in and wall you off, because you can build walls in your own player color that people then have to destroy. It's an interesting mechanic um it's not the entirety of the game so describing this is not like it's not a combative game necessarily but like any splutter game there's a high amount of interactivity that you need to plan for you can't just like build your own little engine and run it independently and hope that nobody messes with you because they probably will eventually by the end of the game you're going to start running into each other uh it is probably the most solo-ish game of theirs that i've played though because even though that happens it doesn't happen a lot, and you really are just doing your own thing. In fact, the rules have you playing simultaneously, because otherwise it would be 12 hours long. So everything you do in the game is simultaneous. And in fact, there's a specific section of the rules called conflict, where you, before everybody does something in one of the phases of the game, you say, I'm going to say there's a conflict, let's determine player order, and we'll play this particular phase out in player order, because it matters if I go first. That only happened like four times the whole game because most of the time it doesn't matter. So game-wise, you produce stuff, you move around, you then build stuff with the stuff you just moved around, and you do it again. <laughs> so uh, in terms of scoring points, which is, of course, the, the, role, the goal of the game, uh, there are two ways to do it. You either build out the very expensive items at the end of the game, which is gold, which you can mine, gold coins, which you can produce, or stock certificates, which you can also produce, which are very difficult to produce because you need multiple gold coins, which requires multiple gold, which requires multiple mines. So pick up and deliver. This goes into this, goes into this, goes into this. The other way you score points is with the wonder construction. So at the end of every round, you can spend resources to put bricks on the wonder. And each row of the wonder is worth 10 points. Your share of that will give you points. So if you're the only person to contribute to a row, you'll get 10 points. If you you are one of two people to contribute, you get five points, so on and so forth. Uh, that's not going to be the bulk of the points. Um, it seemed like that's at the most going to be maybe half of what you'd get, because if you make one stock certificate, that's like 120 points versus on the wonder, I think the most any of us got was like 50 something. So you definitely need to build up the stuff and kind of generate an engine. But at the end of the day, I mean, the game was I had a lot of fun with it. I don't know what I think of it just because the first, 
I don't know, two thirds of it was like a learning curve, just getting used to it. Um, and there's a lot there and it is fiddly as heck. <laughs> there's so much going on on this board because you're constantly moving bits and picking them up and dropping them off. You have to keep track of everything you personally have built, even though other people might be using it because that's like what you're responsible for managing. So it is a bit of a fiddly mess. Uh, not unexpected for a 20 year old game. It has an overlay, a plastic overlay on which you will draw the roads because having them like dropped down would be even messier and just too much. So those are things you have to contend with. Um, so it's definitely not for everybody, but I enjoyed it. I want to play it again. I might even try it solo because I feel like it would work well and there are some solo rules on BGG for it. Uh, and if you like splatter games, this is right in that ballpark. <laughs> is it a buy? I don't know. I haven't played it nearly enough. And it's Splatter, so it's like $150. So uh, it's really hard to ever say a Splatter game is a buy because it's so unique to particular people. I think I would name two of them buys at this point, even though I like all of them. But it's definitely a play. If you have a chance to play it, you have a free four hours, do it. I think you'll have fun. And it's, despite the fact it's 20 years old, it does pick up and deliver in a really interesting way. And you can kind of see the uh, the bones of other games that came after it in there. So... Roads and Boats, 20th Anniversary Edition, lots of fun. We did not play with any of the expansion stuff, which came in this edition of the game, the Ancetra. Uh, all sorts of crazy stuff in there, like airplanes and jewelry and all sorts of things. Um, so maybe after a couple more plays, we'll mix that in. But it's uh, not my full review, I would say, but I don't know if I'll come back to this any time in the next few months because it takes you know a full day to play. So wanted to share my thoughts on it for those of you who might be considering it before it goes back out of print. So that is Roads and Boats 20th Anniversary Edition. I would say give it a shot. Mostly what you have to do with splatter games. They are large. They are intense. They are intimidating. And oftentimes, as you mentioned, they're out of print. And they're often these kind of grail games, if not just being a grail game, because it's usually $150 to start with. And that's a lot to kind of invest to see if you actually like a game. So I can appreciate the apprehension here. I know this isn't a game that I've seen on the edges of board gaming. I see a couple people have it, but it rarely ever comes to the table. And it's something that I definitely want to get to the table. But you mentioned at some point several hours, which I know is not uncommon for a splatter game. But it did frighten me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay it took us four we played for four hours with three wow. people it plays up to six with the expansion it is all simultaneous though so i don't think it's gonna scale the thing is is that unless something happens it's 33 turns right is about how long the game ends up going so you go through the whole cycle like three dozen times almost and that just takes a while even though each turn is like five minutes <laughs> it okay. just takes a while to do all well that. let me jump so to speak to a, another splatter anthony already spoiled my uh my review here but i'm talking about food chain magnet its expansion the catch-up mechanism and other ideas yes that is exactly the title and as anthony was mentioning before splatter is a very unique company and it kind of makes sense this is how they would kind of label and title things and their games are definitely on the heavier side and Food Chain Magnet actually really found a home here in the U.S. I know when this originally came out, it was about $150 U.S. I think it was $100 initially in Europe. And it was one of those situations where a lot of people heard great things about it but wasn't sure if you were going to spend that kind of money because back in the day, $150 for a board game was pretty extreme. I know most Kickstarters now range about $100. But yeah, that was very expensive, and it was a very heavy, crunchy game. And basically the idea was you had this very basic neighborhood that had houses, and you planted down one of your 50-esque style restaurant, and you marketed to the houses in the area. And when they had a desire for a certain food, you delivered it by cooking that food. But everyone else is trying to do the same thing, trying to steal your customers. And it was one of these rare fantastical games that was a solid euro through and through but could not be more cutthroat if it tried because you were there to market additional food to those houses 
which really messed with the other player's plan. So I'm going to market pizza there. Okay, well, you have to market pizza and lemonade now, too. And you're like, I don't have lemonade. Well, you can't market there. But turns out I can. So it was one of those games where people tended to enjoy it, but there was always one or maybe two players who just did not, you know, rock it right from the start. And by the end of the game, they were like just looking to just, get out of there or <laughs> just tank the game because it just was not working for them. So with the expansion here, the catch up mechanism, so, so to speak, what we're looking at is we're looking at a number of modules in this game that you can kind of play together in order to offer a unique experience based upon what you put the, together. And Splatter actually gives a number of ways to actually put those different you know, versions together. So if you are playing a new version of the game or the first time in, play with these, but not with those. Don't throw everything in it all at once. And especially because the materials in this game allows you to play for with six players, which really kind of rackets up the uh, marketing challenge throughout the game. So let me run through very quickly some of the new modules here in the game and some of the mechanisms here. And then I'll talk about my actual play of the game. I did not get a chance to play with all of the different modules and did not get a chance to play with them all together. That is going to be my next play probably this coming weekend. But let me give you an idea. So what you're looking at here is you're looking at a new player board or menu in this case. You're looking at a six player that's going to be added to the game. And one of the things about the game, if you have played it before, halfway through the game when the bank kind of runs out of money, everyone has an opportunity to select how much longer they want the game to go, how much more money is going to be the bank. There is a new system here. The new reserve is actually going to be always $200 per player, but it's going to give you a different opportunity to raise or lower the prices of the food that's going to be for sale in the game. You're also going to get some additional tokens in the game. Some of the tokens are going to go with some of the new food that goes in the game. And there's also going to be larger pieces, which is going to be needed because there is apartment complexes in the game and they're going to want a lot of food. So having the new pieces are a welcome uh, addition to the game, even if you play on a very small level. There's going to be some additional map tiles in the game that are going to kind of, you know, move things around. Some new road tiles that are coming to play, and I'll talk about that a little bit. So you'll actually be able to create new pathways for your restaurant. So in particular, I talked about the, the, the tiles. There are new districts. These new districts offer new opportunities to kind of mess with the game a little bit. There will be tiles with multiple lemonades. There will be tiles that will be able to give you additional gardens that kind of run into each other and, and sponsor new things. I also mentioned roads. There are these lobbyists that you can actually play in the game, and they are going to change the game up significantly. So they're going to add roads, which will actually give you an opportunity to reach other houses, which normally you couldn't. There'll be opportunity for parks. Parks will give you an opportunity to sell food at a higher price. And there'll also be new milestones throughout the game. So with this game, you'll have an opportunity to play with new milestones. Obviously, the new milestones will play into the new foods that you'll be able to produce. You can play with the originals. You can play with the new ones. The original game itself was very linear. So if you stayed on a track of pizza, you were going to go with pizza throughout the game. This one allows you to actually kind of open up the game, which I really enjoyed. There's going to be new marketers, new pizza sold. There's just a whole bunch of new milestones in the game. I recommend playing with those. You're going to have coffee. So coffee is a new drink in the game. What's really interesting about coffee is as someone is, or as a family, so to speak, is leaving their house to pick up the food, if they pass by someone else's restaurant, even if that restaurant's not providing the food, they will be able to sell coffee. There's also coffee shops in the game that's going to sell you additional drinks. You can't market coffee, but coffee is always something that people will always pick up, so it allows you to pick up some additional money. There's kimchi in the game. Now, one of the things with this new expansion is Splatter wanted to recognize the Japanese and the Korean markets that they've been able to sell their games to. So kimchi comes in the game. And what kimchi is able to do is it's going to kind of be a bit of a tiebreaker because people will always prefer whatever they want plus kimchi. If you don't have kimchi, then they're going to go somewhere else that does have kimchi. So it's, it's kind of like an addition kind of here in the game. There's also sushi, 
again, to recognize their Japanese fans out there. Now, people who have houses that have gardens attached to it, they'll always prefer sushi over whatever food has been marketed to their houses. So if you ever played the game and people are marketing a whole bunch of food, you build some sushi restaurants out there and you're able to produce sushi, then people are going to you. Another kind of catch-up mechanism, so to speak, is noodles. So going back to the Korean tradition here, so noodles can replace any other food or drink. So again, when the earlier example of you're selling pizza and someone markets lemonade, but you don't have lemonade, if you have noodles, it takes care of that, which is awesome. The actual catch-up mechanism is if you're using marketing to get to a certain house and you've marketed there, but someone else kind of jumps in there and is able to get the food to that house, well, they swiped your marketing opportunity there. You will be able to, if it's still available early in the game, be able to get the catch-up mechanism, which is a milestone card, which will actually shrink your distance by one. So it'll give you an opportunity to actually sell more goods at a quicker situation. So it's actually one of those situations where you might want to fail right at, at the start so you can pick up that milestone. There's also fry chefs, which will actually allow you to sell fries. Fries are just basically the idea that you'll be able to make a standard amount of money no matter how much food is, is selling for. There's night shift managers where you can be able to play cards that don't require extra money. There's mass marketers. There's rural marketers. There's a rural market that comes into play. There's gourmet food critics. There's movie stars. There's reserve prices. There's just a lot more to this game than there ever has been before. And I mentioned earlier apartments because they're big because as you market to them, they're going to get double and they're going to keep increasing what they want. So by the end of the game, we had a couple of apartment buildings that had a ton of food that they wanted. And some players were able to actually meet that demand and actually score really big late in the game. So food chain mapping, the catch-up mechanism and other ideas, it's basically there to kind of open up the game, give you other ways to win, give you other ways that if for some reason you were locked out of a certain drink or a certain food, you'll be able to come back and be able to meet the customer's needs through sushi, through noodles, through kimchi. It's a much better way to play this game. I played this game a lot and usually there's a certain set of dread when I come into this game because I'm like, if I don't do the right things, it's, it's gonna be a bad game for a very long time. This expansion, opens the game up, gives you different opportunities, actually allows you to put new districts out, as I mentioned, new roads out, so you can actually open the game up. I do want to play this more. I do want to play with the additional modules in the game. As it is, I really enjoy what I've played and look forward to getting it back to the table. So if you do get a chance to play Fuche Magnet, the catch-up mechanisms and other ideas, I highly recommend it. And I tell you what, if I can get all these things to the table again and again, I'll actually pick this game up and say it's a buy. My lo local game group, the four of us, put together a, a 10 by 10 for the year. And Food Chain Magnet's one of them. So we played it for the first time last week, which is the first time I'd played it in a long time. I think most of us had been a little rusty. So we just played the base version, even though a couple of us have the catch-up mechanism expansion in. And it was a lot of fun. It was the first time I feel like I actually wrapped my head around the game and did well. I actually won the game. But immediately afterwards, I'm like, man, it'd be cool with the apartment buildings. That would really change this. Oh, man, I really want to try out with the kimchi and stuff. That's a cool idea. I'm going to kind of mix things up over there. Like, there's just so many different ideas in there and things that'll mix up the game. I think we're still going to play a couple more times vanilla just to make sure we fully have it. But I'm excited. I'm excited to start mixing those. Yeah, I know. Most of the times so, when you see so expansions, cool they usually do come with that extra player that you could throw into the game. And usually that's a can be a big serious issue but the fact that the game allows you to you know meet conditions based upon you know all of the additional marketing that's going to happen is really a lot of fun because throwing a lot of things out there and then being able to counter it is fun when you play the base game and people are throwing things out there and you can't counter it because all of those cards are gone that's not a lot of fun and you just see like i can't you know i can't make pizza and the whole neighborhood's pizza, and you're just sitting back, and you're just like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that's that's what our game was, and that's what every game of this is. I looked back at the scores of the five yep. games I've logged, and there was always, like, one person with, like, 500 bucks, and a couple people in, like, the 200 yeah. range, and one person with, like, 
50. <laughs> like, and that person with 50 yeah. usually is someone who realized they made a mistake early and then have to spend another two or three hours playing the game being like, I can't sure. win. I have to try not to get too grouchy about this. And it's been me a couple of times. It wasn't me this last time, thankfully, but I feel bad for the person that was because you're just like, uh, it sucks, man. I'm sorry. Um, it's just cool that there's new ideas that kind of let you pivot a little bit harder because the game, if you don't have a diverse strategy to start, you just can't pivot in the base game very much. It's very, very true. All right. So for our feature review this week, we are looking at the top 10 sub hobbies of gaming. So, Anthony, you came up with this topic. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so, again, this was like a, let's talk about something not just, just a list of new games. Uh, you know, even just our review today, we're talking about an expansion for an old game and then a reprint of a very old game. So, part of that is, what else is there in the hobby? And to some degree, these are things I do, uh, like two or three of them. And... To another degree, I just I know a lot of people who are doing several of these things. In fact, I just mentioned Food Chain Magnet. One of my friends, Ryan, built a copy of it, a print-and-play copy of Food Chain Magnet that we played with on Friday. We all own a copy, but, you know, he spent way more time building this than we spent money buying ours. So we... And it was good. It was really, you know, he really knows what he's doing. So it was kind of a cool way to play the game. It had some tweaks to it and, like, adjusted certain things to make it more playable with you know certain ways to track things and, and that's cool so i wanted to put together a list of you know the top 10 kind of these little mini hobbies within a hobby uh, that people do with their board games around their board games about board games because there's a lot of different ways to kind of be part of this hobby that isn't just playing games and mm -hmm. shoot i started a whole separate podcast about this you know when i was with much smaller children and didn't, didn't have time to get out of the house a lot of solo play and that ended up being a whole separate thing for me. So I figured, why not run through 10 of these? Um, I didn't put these in any particular order because I feel like it's 100% subjective. And, mm -hmm. you know, everybody's got their own thing. But we did pick out 10. I think it's really interesting that you went with all, like, the healthy habits. Oh, yeah. Or... <laughs> of, of board gaming. Because there's a lot of dark side versions of this that... Break, go down a really, really challenging path along the way. We can mention those. I mean, one of these is, <laughs> I feel like, already starts a little bit on the dark side, and you can do it healthily or you can not. I think most of us don't do it healthily, but we'll get All to right. that one. All right, so why don't you start us off, Anthony? All right, number one on the list is uh, one of the ones that I've gone in on. It's painting. So painting miniatures is not new at all. Like, you go back 20, 30, even 40 years, people were painting their Warhammer miniatures and their Wargaming miniatures and all that stuff. Um, I didn't actually get into that back in the day, despite having a few instances where I was playing Warhammer with friends. But when I got into board gaming, almost immediately I got into painting because my first couple of games were Dreadfleet, which was just like 20 bucks at Myriad. So I picked it up <laughs> back in the early days and started painting it. And then Mice and Mystics, which I actually painted all the pieces for, and I'm very proud of that because it's just like a cool experience to play through that. So I go back to painting a lot. I have a lot of different paints, brush. I have all the materials that you need to do it. I, it's a time thing at this point, but it's one of those most relaxing things that I can do. And it still relates to the hobby that I enjoy. And it's a fun way to spend time by myself. You know, I, I keep coming back to painting again and again, and I see it all the time and I, and I see people enjoying it like yourself and I see the competitions and the learning and all the beautiful paints. And there was at one point I was an art student. I was even an architecture student. So the idea of paint and brushes and things like that is not uncommon to me. But to be honest, more times than not, and obviously sometimes it's because of the minis itself are not that high quality or the paint is not that high quality or obviously my skills are not that high quality. But, you know, there's a certain level of just for me personally of perfectionism that if I painted a mini and it didn't just come out well or the set looked lackluster, I would kind of really be bothered by that. Mm -hmm. So I, I look at a lot of miniatures games and I'm like, all right, this is not great, but it's good. And I'm kind of okay with that. I could see that. Yeah, <laughs> I have the same thing. It, it, st it has stopped me from painting some of my favorite games because I don't sure. want to ruin them. Yeah, and and to be honest too, the, the the kind of funny thing I think it's Rising Sun. There's so many of those uh, 
you know, demon monster creatures that they're so bloody and things like that. I'm just <laughs> like, it's probably better that I don't so I could sleep at night. So yeah, <laughs> let's, let's not paint those things. But I have some great friends who are fantastic artists out there, uh, especially a friend, Jen. She's just does like, such a great job out there. And Kelly, she does amazing things. I just, some of those big miniatures, I don't know how she does it, but she's fantastic. So yeah, I mean, if you can more power to you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's fun. It's not something I do regularly, but it, when I get back to it, I enjoy it. Um, so somewhat related to that is crafting. So okay, that is this basically applies to building your own components or upgrading your components in any way that's not like just going and buying them, which is another thing we could, we'll get to that. But sure, the you know sometimes you get a game in and you look at the pieces and you're like uh, these aren't very good. So and that's you know pretty <laughs> common with a lot of things. Um, and, and that might involve just like printing off stickers and maybe you had little wooden or little cardboard chits and then you get some wooden ones and you slap some stickers on there. Or maybe you build terrain for something. Um, one of the things that I never did this personally because I don't have the time, but it looks really cool. If you go on BGG, you can see people have crafted like terrain for Imperial Assault or Mice and Mystics or really any dungeon crawling game that you can set up and walk people through. And it just really adds a lot of depth to the game. So this kind of goes back to like D&D in general, like people building out all the different pieces and the, the kind of terrain and maps that go with that game. Um, but it really definitely applies to a lot of different types of board games as well. Yeah, I remember probably, you know, back in the day, the thing that really stuck out for me was Love Letter. When mm. Love Letter came out, and it had these little red cubes that were supposed to be the hearts of the game. And I remember people just in mass droves going out to crafting stores or making little replacement things, whether it was hearts or little letters and things like that. And it was such a simple minor component issue that really didn't really play into too much. But everybody, everyone was doing it. And it was one of those things where I just really took notice of it. As you mentioned, D&D miniatures games especially the amount of terrain that people put together the mountains the the care they put into is fantastic you go to a board game store and if you've never been to a board game store definitely go to one especially if they have miniature games and the amount of terrain is insane or if you go to a convention and the diversity of different terrains is is amazing but this happens to be one of the kind of possible dark sides <laughs> of of the hobby because there is no end of things you can craft and there's no level of expense that you could go into to kind of get those components to be the way that you want them to be. And we've seen a lot of versions of this and the BGG store has a lot of component upgrades that sometimes are more expensive than the actual game itself. hundred percent. Yeah. Like I, it was probably a few years ago, but I ordered, there's a, a guy on BGG who does, I believe they're handmade, and they only do a few a year, but they're upgrades to different bits on War of the Ring. So you can get you can get the two towers, you can get Mordor, the Mordor track, and then you can get all of the cities, right? Wow. It's a lot of money, so I didn't do all of it, but I did have to get the two towers and the Mordor track, because I'm like, they look so cool. And I couldn't build those <laughs> in a million years, but just... It adds that 3D element to the board, and it just, I don't know why, but it just really makes it pop and just stands out in the middle of the map. I just, I wish I had the skills to make that kind of stuff because it's so cool to look at. All right, so what's up next? If you did have the skills, Anthony, maybe you could bring in some technology? Yeah, <laughs> and this is where we get to the fun part is 3D printing. Um, not a lot of us have 3D printers. I don't have a 3D printer, but man, do I wish I did. Uh, we were actually <laughs> playing a game of Brass Birmingham the other day, and I remembered, because we were at someone else's house playing with their copy, and I remembered before I left the house, I'm like, oh, I ordered 3D printed trains and boats off of Etsy, like, a year and a half ago that I've never used. And so I, <laughs> I, I dragged those out and I brought them, like, these are amazing. And all it was is somebody made the 3D printing file, they color-coded them, and they printed them out. And that was it, right? But it just added so much to the game. Um mm. If, if only because it like added the 3D element, you could more easily see them on the map and see your roots and how big they were. I can think of a million things I would do with a 3D printer if I could ever afford one and had the space for it. Uh, so to those of you who do, awesome. <laughs> it's cool. Well, 
Well, I don't have one yet myself, and I looked into it a lot, but I know that they are quite expensive, especially if yeah. you want to get something that actually prints quality. Uh, a friend of ours, Mark, he picked up one recently, I think just before Christmas, and he's had a hell of a time with it, even though he spent quite a bit of money for it to be able to make all these different types of inserts and components to go into the game. And I think that thing is going practically 24 seven. Every time I go over there, it's still running. You got that, you know, faint plastic smell in the air and it does cost a lot of money with the filament that mm -hmm. makes up the products and the, the machines itself are not great. I used to have one at the college I worked at and there was always more broken pieces or things that didn't work out than did. So, you know, whoever's come up with a way to actually produce those things of quality, you know, regularly, God bless you, man. I don't know how you do it. Yeah. No kidding. So yeah, 3d printing is amazing, but it's, uh, prohibitively expensive and time consuming to actually do for most of us. Um, the next one, not so much. And this one you and I can both speak to, and that is just mm -hmm. upgrading the storage for our games. Right. So we have inserts and these come in a hundred different forms now. So you got your broken token and your meeple reality. If you want the wood, you got your folded space. If you want your foam core, or you can just make it yourself and cut the foam core. Um, and then alongside that, you have things like sleeving your cards, which sounds so simple, but some of us do it a lot. So it becomes a decent chunk of our time. <laughs> so um, I know you've done both of these to some degree. What do you think? We've talked about sleeving a lot. I think we actually have an episode way back when where we did like a uh, judge situation, so to oh, speak, yeah, yeah. If, if, you know, to sleeve or not to sleeve. That is the question because sleeving becomes very expensive. You know, when I first got into board game, I was like, I'm not going to pay, you know, what I paid for the game in sleeves. And then I'm like, oh, you can get these cheaper sleeves, these penny sleeves. And I'm like, wait a minute. These do not work well at all. So you got to get the expensive sleeves. And then obviously it's time consuming to sleeve everything, but you want to protect your game. But maybe you could pick up a reprint. It's just it's a time consuming situation. But if the sleeves are quality it's always welcome at the game table, uh, again, if they're quality. The inserts are a challenge, to be honest with you. The wood inserts are good. Sometimes they're a little bit ornate, which is either a positive or a negative, depending on how they play and how they fit in the box. They're time-consuming to put together. But again, it's another one of those situations where sleeving can be a very zen activity, and insert building can be a very constructive activity i mean it's nice. it's it, it's a uh you know it's one of those situations where you get to build something which is fun or can be fun if the instructions are correct yeah well yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then I, obviously there's also those kind of uh you know plastic inserts you know those also kind of like pop in and pop out certain cases too oh yeah yeah i mean I, for me it, it ends up being I love building the inserts, and yet usually halfway through building any of them, I get kind of frustrated and want to be done with it. So, and then back in the day, I used to just build them and like, I don't need glue, and now they're just all falling apart. So that was just <laughs> me being impatient. And so with the glue, it takes a really long time to build them. Uh, I've, I've gotten more patient over the years, thankfully. But I like having them when it makes sense to have them. If it speeds up setup, if it, it doesn't just add a bunch of weight to a box where I'm not going to carry it around anymore then it's worth doing. All right. So next one on the list is uh, another one that I've never personally done, but I've experienced plenty of times. And this is just because, you know, my friends do this. Uh, particular Ryan, a friend I mentioned who made the uh, food chain magnet uh, print and play, is making up your own handmade versions of games. And I knew this was a thing. I realized it was like a whole subculture of the hobby and there, there are games that are only print and play. There are people who print and play like upgraded versions of old out of print games. There are people who print and play games like splatter games that cost hundreds of dollars because they're out of print all the time, but there's a lot of them and there's a lot of files and there are a lot of ways to do it. And if you're good at it, they're really solid and you can't really tell the difference in a lot of cases, you know, like, Splatter games, for example, you really can't tell the difference if you have the right components there. Um, is there's a lot of like interesting success stories here too. For example, 
Uh, Black Sonata was a solo game on BGG that won uh, Best Print and Play and then went on to Kickstarter and printed out actual copies that everybody can purchase now. Um, the Dune reprint was based on a fan-made print and play of the very, very out of print Dune from like the 1970s that it is literally the same artwork. They, they licensed it from the person who made that print and play, which is incredible. And yet people who print and played it are like, man, because <laughs> that probably took a lot of work. So it's a fun hobby and I, I appreciate what they do and I really enjoy looking at them and playing the games um my buddy michael just put together a an 18xx game that's been out of print for a long time print and play and it looks amazing god i would never do it myself so many hours <laughs> that they put into this and i just i can't imagine doing it but it's really cool i guess it's one of those things where it's a since it's a designer hobby if you have the opportunity to be part of that design that mm-hmm. creation of the game you have a unique copy of the game Again, it's another one of those situations where you do have to have quality equipment to produce something that's worth your while. I think initially when I got into board gaming, I tried to print out some of those print and plays. It's a really hit and miss kind of situation. Although there are situations, obviously, where you can print out you know, additional player guides or erratas or a number of other things that you that can kind of come into play in the game mm-hmm. that are created by other fans, which is usually... Uh, you know, fantastic as far as helping along with the game. I've always wanted to print, as you mentioned, a, a number of those games out or maybe take it to like a Staples or something and see mm-hmm. if they could print out a, a quality version of it, especially when the games are out of print. It's the only way you can get those games to table. I think back in the day, uh, I think Glory to Rome was mm-hmm. something that was printed and played a lot yeah. because, you know, you couldn't get the black box version and the other one was out of print. Hundred percent, yeah, and it's it's one of those things because I've been you know immersed in it a little bit lately that I've started to think about ways I can upgrade my games. So I've been playing Antique Two a little bit lately, and that's a game where there's a lot of upgrades you can make for like personal rondelles and personal player boards and resource trackers. Those don't come with the game, so we'd have to make them. And mm-hmm. fortunately, I know people with uh, laminators, which I <laughs> can utilize hopefully and make those halfway decent in uh, actual execution. But the point is, like, you don't necessarily have to make a whole game. You can just upgrade what you already have, which kind of falls in line with the first couple that we talked about. All right. So the next one on the list is fan expansions. This is people who play a game maybe a hundred times and think, you know what? I could add to this. I could build something new. I could put some new content in here. And there are so many of these. So... I think Sentinels of the Multiverse is very famous for the sheer number of fan expansions it has. Caverna, its full expansion, the only one it has, is a fan expansion that got picked up and printed uh, by Lookout Games. There are lots and lots of examples of this in the hobby, and it's incredible what some of these fans put together. And it's based on not only their time playing the game, their time playing other games, but just their knowledge of games in general and their ability to as amateur designers kind of build content for something they love. Yeah, I think My Little Scythe was the one that popped Mm. out for me just because, (laughs) you know, who would think that you could actually create something for your child and then turn around and it became a board game, like a full-fledged board game and picked up. You mentioned Forgotten Folk for Caverna. I mean, that was available for print and play for the longest time. And they were really cool about that. You could print it out and play it, you know, with the Caverna set long before it was in print. So that was a great thing, too. And again, it allows us as fans and, you know, people who have a little bit of a love and a little bit of an ability to put something together, you know, that expands upon, you know, the game. And obviously, you know, you're always working out the mechanics in your head. So it's nice to be able to do something on the table. And Anthony, I think. You know, I'm looking forward to your upcoming Spirium fan created expansion <laughs> at some point. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, yeah, if I can get more people to actually play this stupid game with me, I will be all <laughs> over that. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta play it more. Um, I, I don't, you know, it's in the back of my head, man. It's you joke, but it's there. <laughs> I'll do that. I know. I know. Uh, maybe we can get him to come back to it. He did a new version of Kalis. Maybe he'll come back to Spirium. We'll see. Okay. 
All right, so next one on the list is probably the one every single person listening to this has participated in, and that is buying games and collecting games. And I put those separately because buying games is its own beast separate from collecting. Like, I have almost all of Stefan Feld's games, which people give me grief about, but hey, I chose a thing and I collected it and I like them. So <laughs> that's a thing I have. Um, I have all the content for Imperial Assault, which I had to track down some of. That's a thing I went out of my way to collect. I also just buy stuff sometimes, and it's just fun to learn about new games and watch the videos and read people's reviews and decide if something's something I want to pick up and then go and pick it up. And I know this is probably the biggest area where you could be on the dark side of things. Like I mentioned at the beginning, you kind of start on the dark side if you're shopping a lot as a hobby, but it doesn't have to be that way if you do it intentionally. Yeah, I, I, as you mentioned, it, it can go dark. I mean, I think shopping is fun. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. not a shopper and I don't like going shopping, but catching a deal, you know, especially when it comes to board gaming and, you know, whether it's one of those kind of like typical Black Friday sales or just catching an odd game on sale at, at Amazon. You know, back in the day, we, we, used, to, <laughs> we used to talk about the uh, Queen's games that would go up for sale and... Did you catch a Queens game? Oh, yeah, I catch three or four Queens games at a really good price. So shopping for games was definitely, you know, your big hits. And collecting. I mean, obviously, wanting to put together those different designer series of games together is something I've done as well. And it's something I actually continue to do. You know, there are certain games that I still collect, all the expansions, all the promos. Not so much anymore, but there are still some of those. And uh, it's it's got a special feel to it. Absolutely, yeah. All right, so moving on to another one here, and this is I mentioned this at the beginning as well as something that I've well well documented is one of my sub hobbies is solo gaming. So solo gaming is it's just gaming, but there's something different about it because a you have to accumulate games that have solo variants that are designed for solo play. But then also, some games have fan expansions or variants or homebrews, which we'll talk about in a minute, that make them into solo games, of which I've played plenty and very much enjoyed. Uh, so it's a very different beast. You're not scheduling time with people. You're not coordinating. You're not worried about player count. You're just worried about playing the best version of a game that you enjoy for yourself in your own time. And there's like a few different reasons why you would do this. If you're super interested in it or want to learn more, did a whole podcast for years with Jason over at Every Night It's Game Night, um, and he's kind of expanded a little bit beyond solo games over the years, but the first 100 episodes or so are just solo games straight through and through, so you can hear a lot about this there. But the reason I got into it is because after my daughter was born, I was working full-time with like a 12-hour commute and everything on top of it, I just didn't have time to go to game groups. I couldn't coordinate with people. I didn't have the resources so i played games alone because i still like board games and i wanted to get my games to the table and that's what i learned about you know different ways to upgrade my games to make them more tactile and interesting and different ways to increase the difficulty on games that i've already played a bunch of times or you know different ways to track my plays and organize them and, and learn how to get better against certain automas there's just a lot of different ways to approach this and it depends on why you're doing it and what kind of of games you like but solo play is it's huge to the point where it's becoming a awards category and there's new games just designed specifically for this and almost every kickstarter has a solo mode whether it should or shouldn't um it's a selling point yeah it's not a selling point for me although <laughs> solo gaming has been something that i've been taking up because of you and jason in particular because co-op games tend to be a little bit of a hassle getting to the table for mm. a number of reasons, not to mention trying to coordinate everyone's actions so you can do something efficient. Yeah. So <laughs> actually just laying the stuff out there on the table, figuring out how everything ties together and playing those things out is a different experience than board gaming, at least for me. It's not that kind of social get it to the table type of experience. It's a puzzle experience. Yeah. And it's something that I've enjoyed and something that it has a different feel, has a different flavor. And, you know, it's something that I'll come back to again and again. 
Yeah, for a long time, this replaced video games for me, like, completely. And I'm, I'm back to video games a little bit, but, like, there were a couple years there where I did not play a single video game. I just played solo games, and that's filled that same headspace for me. So it is very different. All right, second to last one here, home brewing, And this is different from fan expansions for a couple reasons. This is, like, building variants and tweaking rules and adjusting them to fit your specific style of play and i mentioned solo play but this might also be like let's make the game play with more players or let's make it less aggressive a lot of people take games with take that elements and remove those take that elements uh, there's a lot of different ways to adjust games to fit your specific style of play uh, i mentioned antique a2 i'm going to build personal rondelles for people and personal resource trackers so that you can kind of do all your own stuff on your own space and not feel like someone else is managing your turn it changes the basic idea of the game, but it doesn't actually change any of the mechanics of the game. So homebrewing, I mean, it comes in a lot of different forms, but the idea here is that you're tweaking and adjusting games you already like to fit your specific play style. Yeah, I've played a lot of variants of games. And I think if you get a chance to play a game long enough, you kind of get a sense of the underlying mechanics to the point where, as you mentioned, you can tweak the game or just rearrange the components so it just plays better. We keep hearing about again and again about having the right game group for the game, but we often don't talk about having the right game for the group. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the game needs to be adjusted to fit the group because you can't always adjust the group to fit the game. 100%. Yeah, no, it's it's a funny thing, and people will get upset about it sometimes. Like, well, play a different game then. I'm like, no, but we like this game. We just don't like this single part of the game. So we removed sure. it, right? <laughs> I think the funniest or the quickest example of that was Concept, which was this kind of like charades for introverts where you just, you know, put your cubes at certain spots and certain symbols on things and you try to figure out what someone's getting at. It has a victory point situation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I think I played the victory point situation like, Two minutes in, I was like, nope. And we <laughs> never went back to that again. I, I think I've played that game so many times at this point. If you ask anybody, does it have victory points? They will not believe you. <laughs> <laughs> it just why, right? Like why? Why? No, no. All right. So last one on the list is the big daddy of them all. And I'm not, I don't even, I'm not belittling this in any way by calling it a sub hobby. It's just something a lot of people dabble in. And then it eventually becomes more than a hobby it becomes hopefully part of their career and that's game design itself. So a lot of game designers start out just gamers like us who play a lot of games they enjoy and start tweaking with the rules. Like not everybody sets out to build a game. A lot of people do and that's fantastic, but a lot of people just like have ideas, they jot them down, they play with them a little bit, they get some components, they see what happens, they adjust the rules in existing games, they do the homebrews, they do the fan expansions. And then that grows into something else. They build something out of that. And I think that by itself is its own hobby at a level even beyond a lot of these other ones because it can turn into something so much more, right? Yeah, I think I think that this has been mentioned a lot by a lot of different people. But the idea is that we all have a game inside of ourselves. And, you know, you play so many games and a lot of the mechanics are repeated again and again. And sometimes they're refined. And I think that just mentally, if you're going through so many games, if you are a gamer, so to speak, then you are somewhat putting those things together. I know I've run through a couple of rough drafts through my head, and I think I actually wrote one down at one point, too. And I think you could ask every gamer at the table if you made a game, whether, whether it was a theme or a combination of mechanics, I think they would have a good answer for you. And I think that really adds to your enjoyment of the hobby because as you're playing the game – you can be like, well, I would do it this way. Oh, they did it that way. Wow, that's so ingenious. I never thought about mm. you know, doing drafting or marketing or worker placement in that kind of manner. And wow, that's really interesting. So you actually get to play or you know, plan the game out along with the designer. So it's, it's really, really a fantastic you know, sub you know, hobby here. All right, so that's everything for this week. Until next time, this is Chris. And this is Anthony. And we'll save you all a seat at the table. <laughs>